Chapter Twenty Five of the Mysteries of Paris, Volume One by Eugène Sue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Five Tom and Sarah. Sarah Satan, widow of Count MacGregor, and at this time thirty six or thirty seven years of age, was of an excellent Scotch family, daughter of a baronet and a country gentleman. Beautiful and accomplished, an orphan at seventeen years old, she had left Scotland with her brother, Thomas Satan of Halsbury the absurd predictions of an old highland nurse had excited almost to madness the two leading vices in sarah's character pride and ambition the destiny predicted for her and in which she fully believed was of the highest order in fact sovereign rank the prophecy had been so often repeated that the young scotch girl eventually fully credited its fulfilment and she constantly repeated to herself to bear out her ambitious dream that a fortune-teller had thus promised a crown to the handsome and excellent creature who afterwards sat on the throne of france and who was queen as much by her graces and her kind heart as others have been by their grandeur and majesty strange to say thomas satan as superstitious as his sister encouraged her foolish hopes and resolved on devoting his life to the realization of sarah's dream a dream as dazzling as it was deceptive however the brother and sister were not so blind as to believe implicitly in this highland prophecy and to look absolutely for a throne of the first rank in a splendid disdain of secondary royalties or reigning principalities on the contrary so that the handsome scotch lassie should one day encircle her imperial head with a sovereign crown the haughty pair agreed to condescend to shut their eyes to the importance of the throne they coveted by the assistance of the almanac de gotha for the year of grace eighteen nineteen satan arranged before he left scotland a sort of synopsis of the ages of all the kings and ruling powers in europe then unmarried although very ridiculous yet the brother and sister's ambition was freed from all shameful modes satan was prepared to aid his sister sarah in snatching at the thread of the conjugal band by which she hoped eventually to fasten a crown upon her brows he would be her participator in any and all stratagems which could tend to consummate this end but he would rather have killed his sister than see her the mistress of a prince even though the liaison should terminate in a marriage of reparation the matrimonial inventory that resulted from satan and sarah's researches in the almanac de gotha was satisfactory the germanic confederation furnished forth a numerous contingent of young presumptive sovereigns satan was not ignorant of the sort of german wedlock which is called a left-handed marriage to which as being legitimate to a certain extent he would as a last resource have resigned his sister to germany then it was resolved to bend their steps in order to commence this search for the royal spouse if the project appears improbable such hopes ridiculous let us first reply by saying that unbridled ambition excited by superstitious belief rarely claims for itself the light of reason in its enterprises and will dare the wildest impossibilities yet when we recall certain events even in our own times from high and most reputable morganatic marriages between sovereigns and female subjects down to the loving elopement of miss penelope smith and the prince of capua we cannot refuse some chance of fortunate result to the imagination of satan and sarah let us add that the lady united to a very lovely person singular abilities and very varied talents whilst there were added a power of seduction the more dangerous as it was united to a mind unbending and calculating a disposition cunning and selfish a deep hypocrisy a stubborn and despotic will all covered by the outward show of a generous warm and impassioned nature in her appearance there was as much deceit as in her mind her full and dark eyes now sparkling now languishing beneath her coal-black brow could well dissimulate all the warmth of love and desire yet the burning impulses of love never throbbed beneath her icy bosom no surprise of the heart or of the senses ever intervened to disturb the cold and pitiless calculations of this woman crafty selfish and ambitious when she reached the continent she resolved in accordance with her brother's advice not to commence her conjugal and regal campaign until she had resided some time in paris where she determined to complete her education and rub off the rust of her native country by associating with a society which was embellished by all that was elegant tasteful and refined sarah was introduced into the best society and the highest circles 
thanks to the letters of recommendation and considerate patronage of the english ambassador's lady and the old marquis d'harville who had known tom and sarah's father in england persons of deceitful calculating and cold dispositions acquire with great facility language and manners quite in opposition to their natural character as with them all is outside surface appearance varnish bark or they soon find that if their real characters are detected they are undone so thanks to the sort of instinct of self-preservation with which they are gifted they feel all the necessity of the moral mask and so paint and costume themselves with all the alacrity and skill of a practised comedian thus after six months residence in paris sarah was in a condition to contest with the most parisian of parisian women as to the piquant finish of her wit the charm of her liveliness the ingenuousness of her flirtation and the exciting simplicity of her looks at once chaste and passionate finding his sister in full panoply for his campaign satan left with her for germany furnished with the best letters of introduction the first state of the german confederation which headed sarah's road-book was the grand duchy of gerolstein thus styled in the diplomatic and infallible almanach de gotha for the year of grace eighteen nineteen genealogy of the sovereigns of europe and their families gerolstein grand duke maximilian rodolph tenth december seventeen sixty four succeeded his father charles frederick rodolph twenty first april seventeen eighty five widower january eighteen hundred eight by decease of his wife louisa amelia daughter of john augustus prince of berglen son gustavus rodolph born seventeenth april eighteen hundred three mother dowager grand duchess judith widow of the grand duke charles frederick rodolph twenty first april seventeen eighty five satan with much practical good sense had first noted down on his list the youngest princes whom he coveted as brothers-in-law thinking that extreme youth is more easily seduced than ripened age moreover we have already said that the brother and sister were particularly recommended to the reigning duke of gerolstein by the old marquis d'harville caught like the rest of the world by sarah whose beauty grace and above all delightful manners he could not sufficiently admire it is superfluous to say that the presumptive heir of the grand duchy of gerolstein was gustavus rodolph he was hardly eighteen when tom and sarah were presented to his father the arrival of the young scotch lady was an event in the german court so quiet simple and almost patriarchal in its habits and observances the grand duke a most worthy gentleman governed his states with wise firmness and paternal kindness nothing could exceed the actual and moral happiness of the principality whose laborious and steady population by their soberness and piety presented a pure specimen of the german character this excellent people enjoyed so much real felicity and were so perfectly contented with their condition that the enlightened care of the grand duke was not much called into action to preserve them from the mania of constitutional innovations as far as modern discovery went and those practical suggestions which have a wholesome influence over the well-being and morals of his people the grand duke was always anxious to acquire knowledge himself and apply it invariably for the use and benefit of his people his residence at the capitals of the different states of europe having little else to occupy themselves whilst on their mission but to keep their master fully informed as to the rise and progress of science and all the arts which are connected with public welfare and public utility we have said that the duke felt as much affection as gratitude for the old marquis d'harville who in eighteen fifteen had rendered him immense service and so thanks to his powerful recommendation sarah of halsbury and her brother were received at the court of gerolstein with every distinction and with marked kindness a fortnight after her arrival the young scotch girl endued with so profound a spirit of observation had easily penetrated the firm character and open heart of the grand duke before she began to seduce his son a thing of course she had wisely resolved to discover the disposition of the father although he had appeared to dote on his son she was yet fully convinced that his father with all his tenderness would never swerve from certain principles certain ideas as to the duty of princes and would never consent to what he would consider a mesalliance for his son and that not through pride but from conscience reason and dignity a man of this firm mould and the more affectionate and good in proportion as he is firm and determined 
never abates one jot of that which affects his conscience his reason and his dignity sarah was on the point of renouncing her enterprise in the face of obstacles so insurmountable but reflecting that as rodolph was very young and his gentleness and goodness his character at once timid and meditative were generally spoken of she thought she might find compensation in the feeble and irresolute disposition of the young prince and therefore persisted in her project and again revived her hopes on this new essay the management of herself and brother were most masterly the young lady knew full well how to propitiate all around her and particularly the persons who might have been jealous or envious of her accomplishments and she caused her beauty and grace to be forgotten beneath the veil of modest simplicity with which she covered them she soon became the idol not only of the grand duke but of his mother the dowager grand duchess judith who in spite of or through her ninety years of age loved to excess everything that was young and charming sarah and her brother often talked of their departure but the sovereign of gerolstein would never consent to it and that he might completely attach the two to him he pressed on sir thomas satan the acceptance of the vacant post of his first groom of the chamber and entreated sarah not to quit the grand duchess judith as she could not do without her after much hesitation overcome by the most pressing entreaties sarah and satan accepted such brilliant offers and decided on establishing themselves at the court of gerolstein where they had been for two months sarah who was an accomplished musician knowing the taste of the grand duchess for the old masters and above all for gluck sent for the chef d'oeuvre of this attractive composer and fascinated the old princess by her unfailing complaisance as well as the remarkable skill with which she sang those old airs so beautiful in their melody so expressive in their character as for satan he knew how to make himself very useful in the occupation which had been conferred upon him he was a good judge of horses was orderly and firm in his conduct and arrangements and so in a short time completely remodelled the stables of the grand duke which up to that time had been neglected and become disorganized the brother and sister were soon equally beloved feted and admired in this court the master's preference soon commands the preference of those below him sarah required in aid of her future projects too much aid not to employ her insinuating powers in acquiring partisans her hypocrisy clothed in most attractive shapes easily deluded the simple-hearted germans and the general feeling soon authorized the extreme kindness of the grand duke thus then our designing pair were established at the court of gerolstein agreeably and securely placed without any reference to rodolph by a lucky chance some days after the arrival of sarah the young prince had gone away to the inspection of troops with an aide-de-camp and the faithful murphy this absence doubly auspicious to the views of sarah allowed her to arrange at her ease the principal threads of the fillet she was weaving without being deterred by the presence of the young prince whose too open admiration might perhaps have awakened the suspicions of the grand duke on the contrary in the absence of his son he did not unfortunately reflect that he was admitting into the closest intimacy a young girl of surpassing beauty and of lively wit as rodolph must discover at every moment of the day sarah was perfectly insensible to a reception so kind and generous to the full confidence with which she was introduced into the very heart of this sovereign family neither brother nor sister paused for a moment in their bad designs they determined upon a principle to bring trouble and annoyance into this peaceable and happy court they calmly calculated the probable results of the cruel divisions they should establish between a father and son up to that period so tenderly united a few words concerning rodolph's early days may be necessary during his infancy he had been extremely delicate his father reasoned thereon in this strange manner english country gentlemen are generally remarkable for their robust health this advantage results generally from their bodily training which is simple rural and develops their full vigour rodolph must leave the hands of women his temperament is delicate and perhaps by accustoming this child to live like the son of an english farmer with some few exceptions i shall strengthen his constitution the grand duke sent to england for a man worthy of the trust and capable of directing such a course of bodily culture and sir walter murphy an athletic specimen of a yorkshire country gentleman was entrusted with this important charge 
the direction which he gave to the mind and body of the young prince were such as entirely coincided with the views and wishes of the grand duke murphy and his pupil lived for many years in a beautiful farmhouse situated in the midst of woods and fields some leagues from the capital of gerolstein and in a most picturesque and salubrious spot rodolph free from all etiquette and employed with murphy in an outdoor labour proportionate to his age lived the sober manly and regular life of the country having for his pleasure and amusement the violent exercises of wrestling pugilism riding on horseback and hunting in the midst of the pure air of the meadows woods and mountains he underwent an entire change and grew up as vigorous as a young oak his pale cheek became suffused with the ruddy glow of health always lithe and active he underwent now the most severe fatigues his address energy and courage supplying what was deficient in his muscular power so that when only in his fifteenth or sixteenth year he was always the conqueror in his contest with young men his superiors in age his scientific education necessarily suffered from the preference given to his physical training and rodolph's knowledge was very limited but the grand duke very wisely reflected that to have a well-informed mind it must be supported by a strong physical frame and that this acquired the intellectual faculties would develop themselves the more rapidly the kind walter murphy was by no means a sage and could only convey to rodolph some primary instruction but no one knew better than he how to inspire his pupil with the feeling of what is just loyal and generous and a horror of everything that was mean low and contemptible these repugnances these powerful and wholesome admonitions took deep and lasting root in the very soul of rodolph and although in after life these principles were violently shaken by the storm of passions yet they were never eradicated from his heart the leaven bolt strikes splits and rends the deeply planted tree but the sap still maintains its hold in the roots and a thousand green branches spring fresh from what was taken for a withered and dead tree murphy then gave to rodolph if we may use the expression health to body and mind he made him robust active and daring with a love for all that was good and right and a hatred for whatsoever was wicked and bad having fulfilled his task to admiration the squire called to england on very important business left germany for some time to the great regret of rodolph who loved him extremely his son's health having been so satisfactorily established the grand duke turned his most serious attention to the mental education of his dearly beloved son a certain dr cesar polidori a renowned linguist a distinguished chemist learned historian and deeply versed in the study of all the exact and physical sciences was entrusted with the charge of cultivating and improving the rich but virgin soil so carefully and well prepared by murphy this time the grand duke's choice was a most unfortunate one or rather his religious feelings were infamously imposed upon by the person who introduced the doctor to him and caused him to think on polidori as the preceptor of the young prince atheist cheat and hypocrite full of stratagem and trick concealing the most dangerous immorality the most hardened scepticism under an austere exterior profoundly versed in the knowledge of human nature or rather only having tried the worst side the disgraceful passions of humanity dr polidori was the most hateful mentor that could have been entrusted with the education of a young man rodolph left with the deepest regrets the independent and animating life which he had hitherto led with murphy to go and become pale with the study of books and submit himself to the irksome ceremonies of his father's court and he at once entertained a strong prejudice against his tutor it could not be otherwise on quitting his young friend the poor squire had compared him and with justice to a young wild colt full of grace and fire carried off from his native prairies where he had dwelt free as air and joyous as a bird to be bridled and spurred that he might under that system learn how to moderate and economize those powers which hitherto he had only employed in running and leaping in any way he pleased rodolph began by telling polidori that he had no taste for study but that he greatly preferred the free exercise of his arms and legs to breathe the pure air of the fields to traverse the woods and the mountains and that a good horse and a good gun were preferable to all the books in the universe the doctor was prepared for this antipathy and was secretly delighted at it 
for in another way the hopes of this man were as ambitious as those of sarah although the grand duchy of gerolstein was only a secondary state polidori indulged the idea of being one day its richelieu and of making rodolph play the part of the do-nothing prince but desirous above all things of currying favour with his pupil and of making him forget murphy by his own concession and compliance he concealed from the grand duke the young prince's repugnance for study and boasted of his application to and rapid progress in his studies whilst some examinations arranged between himself and rodolph which had the air of being impromptu questions confirmed the grand duke in his blind and implicit confidence by degrees the dislike which rodolph at first entertained for the doctor changed on the young prince's part into a cool familiarity very unlike the real attachment he had for murphy by degrees he found himself leagued with polidori although from very innocent causes by the same ties that unite two guilty persons sooner or later rodolph was sure to despise a man of the age and character of the doctor who so unworthily lied to excuse the idleness of his pupil this polidori knew but he also knew that if we do not at once sever our connections with corrupt minds in disgust by degrees and in spite of our better reason we become familiar with and too frequently admire them until insensibly we hear without shame or reproach those things mocked at and vituperated which we formerly loved and revered besides the doctor was too cunning all at once to shock certain noble sentiments and convictions which rodolph had derived from the admirable lessons of murphy after having vented much raillery on the coarseness of the early occupations of his young pupil the doctor laying aside his thin mask of austerity had greatly aroused the curiosity and heated the fancy of the young prince by the exaggerated descriptions strongly drawn and deeply coloured of the pleasures and gallantries which had illustrated the reigns of louis the fourteenth the regent and especially louis the fifteenth the hero of cesar polidori he assured the misled boy who listened to him with a fatal earnestness that pleasures however excessive far from demoralizing a highly accomplished prince often made him merciful and generous inasmuch as fine minds are never more predisposed to benevolence and clemency than when acted upon by their own enjoyments louis the fifteenth the bien-aimé the well-beloved was an unanswerable proof of this and then added the doctor how entirely have the greatest men of all ages and all countries abandoned themselves to the most refined epicureanism from alcibiades to maurice of saxony from anthony to the great conde from caesar to vendome such conversations must make deep and dangerous impressions on a young ardent and virgin mind and such theories could not be without their results in the midst of this well-regulated and virtuous court accustomed after the example of its ruler to honest pleasures and harmless amusements rodolph instructed by polidori dreamt of the dissipated knights of versailles the orgies of choisy the attractive voluptuousness of the parc aux Cerf, and also from time to time of some romantic amours contrasting with these neither had the doctor failed to prove to rodolph that a prince of the germanic confederation should not have any military pretension beyond sending his contingent to the diet the feeling of the time was not warlike according to the doctor to pass his time delightfully and idly amongst women and the refinements of luxury to repose from time to time from the animation of sensual pleasures amidst the delightful attractions of the fine arts to hunt occasionally not as a nimrod but as an intelligent epicurean and enjoy the transitory fatigues which make idleness and repose taste but the sweeter this was the only life which a prince should think of enjoying who and this was his height of happiness could find a prime minister capable of devoting himself boldly to the distressing and overwhelming burden of state affairs rodolph in abandoning himself to ideas which were free from criminality because they did not spring from the circle of fatal probabilities resolved that when providence should call to himself the grand duke his father he would devote himself to the life which cesar polidori had painted to him under such brilliant and attractive colours and to have as his prime minister one whose knowledge and understanding he admired and whose blind complaisance he fully appreciated it is useless to say that the young prince kept the most perfect silence upon the subject of these pernicious hopes which had been excited within him knowing that the heroes of the grand duke's admiration were gustavus adolphus 
charles the twelfth and the great frederick maximilian rodolph had the honour of belonging to the royal house of brandenburg rodolph thought reasonably enough that the prince his father who professed so profound an admiration for these king captains always booted and spurred continually mounted on their chargers and engaged in making war would consider his son out of his senses if he believed him capable of wishing to displace the tudescan gravity of his court by the introduction of the light and licentious manners of the regency a year eighteen months passed away at the end of this time murphy returned from england and wept for joy on again embracing his young pupil after a few days although unable to discover the reason of a change which so deeply afflicted him the worthy squire found rodolph chilled and constrained in his demeanour towards him and almost rude when he recalled to him his sequestered and rural life assured of the natural kind heart of the young prince and warned by a secret presentiment murphy thought him for a time perverted by the pernicious influence of dr polidori whom he instinctively abhorred and resolved to watch very narrowly the doctor for his part was very much annoyed by murphy's return for he feared his frankness good sense and keen penetration he instantly resolved therefore cost what it might to ruin the worthy englishman in rodolph's estimation it was at this crisis that satan and sarah were presented and received at the court of gerolstein with such extreme distinction we have said that rodolph accompanied by murphy had been absent from the court on a journey for some weeks during this absence the doctor was by no means idle it is said that intriguers discover and recognize each other by certain mysterious signs which allow of them observing each other until their interests decide them to form a close alliance or declare unremitting hostility some days after the establishment of sarah and her brother at the court of the grand duke polidori became a close ally of satan's the doctor confessed to himself with delectable cynicism that he felt a natural affinity for rogues and villains and so he said that without pretending to discover the end which sarah and her brother desired to achieve he was attracted towards them by a sympathy so strong as to lead him to imagine that they plotted some devilish purpose some questions of satan's as to the disposition and early life of rodolph questions which would have passed without notice with a person less awake to all that occurred than the doctor in a moment enlightened him as to the ulterior aims of the brother and sister all he doubted was that the aspirations of the scotch lady were at the same time honourable as well as ambitious the arrival of this lovely young woman appeared to polidori a godsend rodolph's mind was already inflamed with amorous imaginings sarah might become or be made the delicious reality which would substantiate so many glorious dreams it was not to be doubted but that she would secure an immense influence over a heart submitted to the witching spell of a first love the doctor instantly laid his plan to direct and secure this influence and to make it serve also as the means of destroying murphy's power and reputation like a skilful intriguer he soon informed the aspiring pair that they must come to an understanding with him as he alone was responsible to the grand duke for the private life of the young prince sarah and her brother understood him in a moment although they had not told the doctor a syllable of their secret designs on the return of rodolph and murphy all three combined by one common intent tacitly leagued against the squire their most redoubtable enemy what was to happen did happen rodolph saw sarah daily after his return and became desperately enamoured she soon told him that she shared his love although she foresaw that this love would create great trouble he could never be happy the distance that separated them was too wide she then recommended to rodolph the most profound discretion for fear of arousing the grand duke's suspicions as he would be inexorable and deprive them of their only happiness that of seeing each other every day the young prince promised to be cautious and conceal his love the scotch maiden was too ambitious too self-possessed to compromise and betray herself in the eyes of the court and rodolph perceiving the necessity of dissimulation imitated sarah's prudence the lover's secret was carefully preserved for some time nor was it until the brother and sister saw the unbridled passion of their dupe reach its utmost excess and that his infatuation which he could hardly restrain threatened to burst forth afresh and destroy all that they resolved on their final coup the doctor's character authorizing the confidence besides the morality which invested it 
satan opened to him on the necessity of a marriage between rodolph and sarah otherwise he added with perfect sincerity he and his sister would instantly leave gerolstein sarah participated in the prince's affection but preferring death to dishonour she could only be the wife of his highness this exalted flight of ambition stupefied the doctor who had never imagined that sarah's imagination soared so high a marriage surrounded by numberless difficulties and dangers appeared impossible to polidori and he frankly told satan the reasons why the grand duke would never submit to such a union satan agreed in the importance of the reasons but proposed as a mezzo termini which should meet all objections a marriage which although secret should be legal and only avowed after the decease of the grand duke sarah was of a noble and ancient house and such a union was not without precedent satan gave the prince eight days to decide his sister could no longer endure the cruel anguish of uncertainty and if she must renounce rodolph's love she must act up to her painful resolve as promptly as might be certain that he could not mistake sarah's views the doctor was sorely perplexed he had three ways before him to inform the grand duke of the matrimonial project to open rodolph's eyes as to the manoeuvres of tom and sarah to lend himself to the marriage but to inform the grand duke would be to alienate from him for ever the heir presumptive to the throne to enlighten rodolph on the interested views of sarah was to expose himself to the reception which a lover is sure to give when she whom he loves is depreciated in his eyes and then what a blow for the vanity or the heart of the young prince to let him know that it was for his royal rank alone that the lady was desirous to wed him on the other hand by lending himself to this match polidori bound rodolph and sarah to him by a tie of the strongest gratitude or at least by the complicity of a dangerous act no doubt all might be discovered and the doctor exposed to the anger of the grand duke but then the marriage would have been concluded the union legal the storm would blow over and the future sovereign of gerolstein would become the more bound to polidori in proportion as the doctor had undergone greater dangers in his service after much consideration therefore he resolved on serving sarah but with a certain qualification which we will presently refer to rodolph's passion had reached a height almost of frenzy violently excited by constraint and the skilful management of sarah who pretended to feel still more than he did the insurmountable obstacles which honour and duty placed between them and their liberty in a few days more the young prince would have betrayed himself thus when the doctor proposed that he must never see his enchantress again or possess her by a secret marriage rodolph threw himself on polidori's neck called him his saviour his friend his father he only wished that the temple and the priest were at hand that he might marry her that instant the doctor resolved for reasons of his own to undertake the management of all he found a priest witnesses and the union all the formalities of which were carefully scrutinized and verified by satan was secretly celebrated during a temporary absence of the grand duke at a conference of the german diet the prophecy of the scotch soothsayer was fulfilled sarah wedded the heir to a throne without quenching the fire of his love possession rendered rodolph more circumspect and cooled down that violence which might have compromised the secret of his passion for sarah but directed by satan and the doctor the young couple managed so well and observed so much circumspection towards each other that they eluded all detection an event impatiently desired by sarah soon turned this calm into a tempest she was about to become a mother it was then that this woman evinced all those exactions which were so new to and so much astonished rodolph she protested with hypocritical tears streaming from her eyes that she could no longer support the constraint in which she lived a constraint rendered the more insupportable by her pregnancy in this extremity she boldly proposed to the young prince to tell all to his father who was as well as the dowager grand duchess fonder than ever of her no doubt she added he will be very angry greatly enraged at first but he loves his son so tenderly so blindly and had for her sarah so strong an affection that his paternal anger would gradually subside and she would at last take in the court of gerolstein the rank which was due to her she might say in a double sense because she was about to give birth to a child which would be the heir presumptive to the grand duke these pretensions alarmed rodolph 
he knew the deep attachment which his father had for him but he also well knew the inflexibility of his principles with regard to all the duties of a prince to all these objections sarah replied unmoved i am your wife in the presence of god and men in a short time i shall no longer be able to conceal my situation and i ought not to blush at that of which i am on the contrary so proud and would desire openly to acknowledge the expectation of posterity had redoubled rodolph's tenderness for sarah and placed between the desire to accede to her wishes and the dread of his father's wrath he experienced the bitterest anguish satan sided with his sister the marriage is indissoluble said he to his royal brother-in-law the grand duke may exile you from his court you and your wife nothing more but he loves you too much to have recourse to such an extremity he will endure what he cannot prevent these reasons strong enough in themselves did not soothe rodolph's anxieties at this juncture satan was charged by the grand duke with an errand to visit several breeding studs in austria this mission which he could not refuse would only detain him a fortnight he set out with much regret and in a very important moment for his sister she was chagrined yet satisfied at the departure of her brother for she would lose his advice but then he would be safe from the grand duke's anger if all were discovered sarah promised to keep satan fully informed day by day of the progress of events so important to both of them and that they might correspond more surely and secretly they agreed upon a cipher of which polidori also held the key this precaution alone proves that sarah had other matters to tell her brother of besides her love for rodolph in truth this selfish cold ambitious woman had not felt the ice of her heart melt even by the beams of the passionate love which had been breathed to her her maternity was only with her a means of acting more effectually on rodolph and had no softening effect on her iron soul the youth headlong love and inexperience of the prince who was hardly more than a child and so perfidiously ensnared into an inextricable position hardly excited an interest in the mind of this selfish creature and in her confidential communications with him she complained with disdain and bitterness of the weakness of this young man who trembled before the most paternal of german princes who lived however very long in a word this correspondence between the brother and sister clearly developed their unbounded selfishness their ambitious calculations their impatience which almost amounted to homicide and laid bare the springs of that dark conspiracy crowned by the marriage of rodolph one of sarah's letters to her brother was abstracted by polidori the channel of their mutual communications for what purpose we shall see hereafter a few days after satan's departure sarah was at the evening court of the dowager grand duchess many of the ladies present looked at her with an astonished air and whispered to their neighbours the grand duchess judith in spite of her ninety years had a quick ear and a sharp eye and this little whispering did not escape her she made a sign to one of the ladies in waiting to come to her and from her she learned that everybody was remarking that the figure of miss sarah satan of halsbury was less slender less delicate in its proportions than usual the old princess adored her young protege and would have answered to god himself for sarah's virtue indignant at the malevolence of those remarks she shrugged her shoulders and said aloud from the end of the saloon in which she was sitting my dear sarah come here sarah rose it was requisite to cross the circle to reach the place where the princess was seated who was anxious most kindly to destroy the rumour that was circulated and by the simple fact of thus crossing the room confound her calumniators and prove triumphantly that the fair proportions of her protege had lost not one jot of their symmetry and delicacy alas the most perfidious enemy could not have devised a better plan than that suggested by the worthy princess in her desire to defend her protege sarah came towards her and it required all the deep respect due to the grand duchess to repress the murmur of surprise and indignation when the young lady crossed the room the nearest sighted person saw what sarah would no longer conceal for her pregnancy might have been hidden longer had she but have chosen but the ambitious woman had sought this display in order to compel rodolph to declare his marriage the grand duchess who however would not be convinced in spite of her eyesight said in a low voice to sarah my dear child how very ill you have dressed yourself to-day you 
whose shape may be spanned by ten fingers i hardly know you again we will relate hereafter the results of this discovery which led to great and terrible events at this moment we will content ourselves with stating what the reader has no doubt already guessed that fleur de marie was the fruit of the secret marriage of rodolph and sarah and that they both believed their daughter dead it has not been forgotten that rodolph after having visited the house in the rue du temple had returned home and intended in the evening to be present at a ball given by the blank ambassadress it was to this fete that we shall follow his royal highness the reigning grand duke of gerolstein gustavus rodolph travelling in france under the name of the count de duren end of chapter twenty five chapter twenty six of the mysteries of paris volume one by eugene sue this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty six the ball as the eleventh hour of the night sounded from the different clocks in paris the gates of an hotel in the rue plumet were thrown open by a swiss in rich livery and forthwith issued a magnificent dark blue berlin carriage drawn by two superb long-tailed grey horses on the seat which was covered by a rich hammer-cloth trimmed with a mossy silk fringe sat a portly-looking coachman whose head was ornamented by a three-cornered hat while his rotund figure looked still more imposing in his dress livery coat of blue cloth trimmed up the seams with silver lace and thickly braided with the same material the whole finished by a splendid sable collar and cuffs behind the carriage stood a tall powdered lackey dressed in a livery of blue turned up with yellow and silver and by his side was a chasseur whose fierce-looking moustaches gaily embroidered dress and hat half concealed by a waving plume of blue and yellow feathers completed a most imposing coup d'oeil the bright lights of the lamps revealed the costly satin lining of the interior of the vehicle we are describing in which were seated rodolph having on his right hand the baron de groan and opposite to him the faithful murphy out of deference for the sovereign represented by the ambassador to whose ball he was then proceeding rodolph bore no other mark of distinction than the diamond order of blank round the neck of sir walter murphy and suspended by a broad orange riband hung the enamelled cross of the grand commander of the golden eagle of gerolstein and a similar insignia decorated the baron de groan amidst an infinite number of the crosses and badges of honour belonging to all countries depending by a gold chain placed in the two full buttonholes of the diplomatist's coat i am delighted said rodolph with the very favourable accounts i have received from madame georges respecting my poor little protege at the farm of bouqueval david's care and attention have worked wonders a propos of la goualeuse what do you think sir walter murphy any of your cité acquaintances would say at seeing you so strangely disguised as at present they would consider you most valiant charcoal man to be they would be somewhat astonished i fancy much in the same degree as the surprise your royal highness would excite among your new acquaintances in the rue du temple were you to proceed thither as now attired to pay a friendly visit to madame pipelet and to inquire after the health of cabrion's victim the poor melancholy alfred my lord has drawn so lively a sketch of alfred attired in his long-skirted green coat and bell-crowned hat said the baron that i can well imagine him seated in magisterial dignity in his dark and smoky lodge let me hope that your royal highness's visit to the rue du temple has fully answered your expectations and that you are in every way satisfied with the researches of my agent perfectly so answered rodolph my success was even beyond my expectations then after a moment's painful silence and to drive away the train of thought conjured up by the recollection of the probable guilt of madame d'harville he resumed in a tone more gay i am almost ashamed to own to so much childishness but i confess myself amused with the contrast between my treating madame pipelet in the morning to a glass of cordial and then proceeding in the evening to a grand fete with all the pomp and prestige of one of those privileged beings who by the grace of god reign over this lower world some men of small fortune would speak of my revenues as those of a millionaire added rodolph in a sort of parenthesis alluding to the limited extent of his estates and many millionaires my lord might not have the rare the admirable good sense of the man of narrow means ah my dear de graun you are really too good much too good 
you really overwhelm me replied rodolph with an ironical smile while the baron glanced at murphy with the consciousness of a man who has just discovered he has been saying a foolish thing really my dear de groen resumed rodolph i know not how to acknowledge the weight of your compliment or how to repay such delicate flattery in its own way my lord let me entreat of you not to take the trouble exclaimed the baron who had for the instant forgotten that rodolph who detested every species of flattery always revenged himself by the most unsparing raillery on those who directly or indirectly addressed it to him nay baron i cannot allow myself to remain in your debt you have praised my understanding i will in return admire your countenance for by my honour as i sit beside you you look like a youth of twenty antinous himself could not boast of finer features or a more captivating expression my lord my lord i cry your mercy behold him murphy and say whether apollo could display more graceful limbs more light and youthful proportions i beseech you my lord to pardon me from the recollection of how long it is since i have permitted myself to utter the slightest compliment to your royal highness observe murphy this band of gold which restrains without concealing the locks of rich black hair flowing over this graceful neck and my lord my lord for pity's sake spare me i repent most sincerely of my involuntary fault said the unfortunate baron with an expression of comic despair on his countenance truly ludicrous it must not be forgotten that the original of this glowing picture was at least fifty years of age his hair grey frizzled and powdered a stiff white cravat round his throat a pale withered countenance and golden spectacles upon the horny bridge of his sharp projecting nose pardon my lord pardon for the baron exclaimed the squire laughing i beseech you not to overwhelm him beneath the weight of your mythological illusions i will be answerable to your royal highness that my unlucky friend here will never again venture to utter a flattery since so truth is translated in the new vocabulary of gerolstein what old murphy too are you going to join in the rebellion against sincerity my lord i am so sorry for the position of my unfortunate vis-a-vis -vis that i beg i may divide his punishment with him charcoal man in ordinary your disinterested friendship does you honour but seriously now my dear de graun how have you forgotten that i only allow such fellows as darnheim and his train to flatter for the simple reason that they know not how to speak the truth that a cuckoo note of false praise belongs to birds of such feather as themselves and the species they claim relationship with but for a person of your mind and good taste to descend to its usage oh fie baron fie it is all very well my lord said the baron sturdily but i must be allowed to say with all due apology for my boldness that there is no small portion of pride in your royal highness's aversion to receive even a just compliment well said baron come i like you better now you speak plain truths but tell me how you prove your assertion why just so my lord because you repudiate it upon the same principle that might induce a beautiful woman well aware of her charms to say to one of her most enthusiastic admirers i know perfectly well how handsome i am and therefore your approval is perfectly uncalled for and unnecessary what is the use of reiterating what everybody knows is it usual to proclaim in the open streets that the sun shines when all may see and feel certain of his midday brightness now baron you are shifting your ground and becoming more dangerous as you become more adroit and by way of varying your punishment i will only say that the infernal polidori himself could not have more ingeniously disguised the poisonous draught of flattery when seeking to persuade some poor victim to swallow it my lord i am now effectually silenced then said murphy and this time with an air of real seriousness your royal highness has now no doubt as to its being really polidori you encountered in the rue du temple i have ceased to have the least doubt on the subject since i learned through you that he had been in paris for some time past i had forgotten or rather purposely omitted to mention to your lordship said murphy in a sorrowing tone a name that never failed to awaken painful feelings and knowing as i do how justly odious the remembrance of this man was to your royal highness i studiously abstain from all reference to it 
the features of rodolph were again overshadowed with gloom and plunged in deep reverie he continued to preserve unbroken silence which prevailed until the carriage stopped in the courtyard of the embassy the windows of the hotel were blazing with a thousand lights which shone brightly through the thick darkness of the night while a crowd of lackeys in full-dress liveries lined the entrance hall extending even to the salons of reception where the grooms of the chamber waited to announce the different arrivals monsieur le comte blank the ambassador with his lady had purposely remained in the first reception room until the arrival of rodolph who now entered followed by murphy and monsieur de Groen. rodolph was then in his thirty-sixth year in the very prime and perfection of manly health and strength his regular and handsome features with the air of dignity pervading his whole appearance would have rendered him under any circumstances a strikingly attractive man but combined with the eclat of high birth and exalted rank he was a person of first-rate importance in every circle in which he presented himself and whose notice was assiduously sought for dressed with the utmost simplicity rodolph wore a white waistcoat and cravat a blue coat buttoned up closely on the right breast of which sparkled a diamond star displayed to admiration the light yet perfect proportions of his graceful figure while his well-fitting pantaloons of black kerseymere defined the finely formed leg and handsome foot in its embroidered stocking from the rareness of the grand duke's visits to the haut monde his arrival produced a great sensation and every eye was fixed upon him from the moment that attended by murphy and baron de Grone, he entered the first salon at the embassy an attache deputed to watch for his arrival hastened immediately to appraise the ambassadress of the appearance of her illustrious guest her excellency instantly hurried with her noble husband to welcome their visitor exclaiming your royal highness is indeed kind thus to honour our poor entertainment nay madame replied rodolph gracefully bowing on the hand extended to him your ladyship is well aware of the sincere pleasure it affords to pay my compliments to yourself and as for monsieur le comte he and i are two old friends who are always delighted to meet are we not my lord your royal highness in deigning to continue to me so flattering a place in your recollection makes it still more impossible for me ever to forget your many acts of condescending kindness i assure you monsieur le comte that in my memory the past never dies or at least the pleasant part of it for i make it a strict rule never to preserve any reminiscences of my friends but such as are agreeable and gratifying your royal highness has found the secret of being happy in your thoughts and rendering others so at the same time rejoined the ambassador smiling with gratified pride and pleasure at a conference so cordially carried on before a gathering crowd of admiring auditors thus then madame replied rodolph will your flattering reception of to-night live long in my memory and i shall promise myself the happiness of recalling this evening's fete with its tasteful arrangements and crowd of attending beauties ah madame la comtesse who like you can effect such a union of taste and elegance as now sparkles around us your royal highness is too indulgent but i have a very important question to ask you why is it that lovely as are your fair guests their charms are never seen to such perfection as when assembled beneath your hospitable roof your royal highness is pleased to view our fair visitants through the same flattering medium with which you are graciously pleased to behold our poor endeavours for your and their amusement answered the ambassador with a deferential bow your pardon count replied rodolph if i differ with you in opinion according to my judgment the cause proceeds wholly from our amiable hostess madame l'ambassadrice may i request of your royal highness to solve this enigma inquired the countess smiling that is easily given madame and it may be found in the perfect urbanity and exquisite grace with which you receive your lovely guests and whisper to each a few charming and encouraging words which if the least bit exceeding strict truth said rodolph smiling with good-tempered satire renders those who are even praised above their merits more radiant in beauty from your kind commendations while those whose charms admit of no exaggeration are no less radiant with the happiness of finding themselves so justly appreciated by you thus each countenance thanks to the gentle arts you practise is made to exhibit the most smiling delight for perfect content will set off even homely features and thus i account for why it is that woman all lovely as she is never looks so much so as when seen beneath your roof come monsieur l'ambassadeur own that i have made out a good case 
and that you entirely concur with me in opinion your royal highness has afforded me too many previous reasons to admire and adopt your opinions for me to hesitate in the present instance and for me my lord said the countess at the risk of being included among those fair ladies who get a little more praise or flattery which was it your highness styled it than they deserve i accept your very flattering explanation with as much qualified pleasure as if it were really founded on truth in order more effectually to convince you madame that nothing is more correct than all i have asserted let us make a few observations touching the fine effect of praise in animating and lighting up the countenance ah my lord you are laying a very mischievous snare for me said the countess smiling well then i will abandon the idea but upon one condition that you honour me by taking my arm i have been told wonderful things of a winter garden a work from fairyland may i put up my humble petition to be allowed to see this new wonder of a hundred and one nights oh my lord with the utmost pleasure but i see that your highness has received a most exaggerated account perhaps you will accompany me and judge for yourself only in this instance i would fain hope that your habitual indulgence may induce you to feel as little disappointment as possible at finding how imperfectly the reality equals your expectations the ambassadress then took the offered arm of rodolph and proceeded with him to the other salons while the count remained conversing with the baron de groen and murphy whom he had been acquainted with for some time and a more beautiful scene of enchantment never charmed the eye than that presented by the aspect of the winter garden to which rodolph had conducted his noble hostess let the reader imagine an enclosure of about forty feet in length and thirty in width leading out of a long and splendid gallery surmounted by a glazed and vaulted roof the building being securely covered in for about fifty feet round the parallelogram it described the walls were concealed by an infinite number of mirrors over which was placed a small and delicate trellis of fine green rushes which thanks to the strong light reflected on the highly polished glass resembled an arbour and were almost entirely hidden by a thick row of orange trees as large as those of the tuileries mixed with camellias of equal size while the golden fruit and verdant foliage of the one contrasted beautifully with the rich clusters of waxen flowers of all colours with which the other was loaded the remainder of the garden was thus devised five or six enormous clumps of trees and indian or other tropical shrubs planted in immense cases filled with peat earth were surrounded by alleys paved with a mosaic shell-work and sufficiently wide for two or three persons to walk abreast it is impossible to describe the wondrous effect produced by this rich display of tropical vegetation in the midst of a european winter and almost in the very centre of a ballroom here might be seen gigantic bananas stretching their tall arms to the glass roof which covered them and blending the vivid green of their palms with the lanceolated leaves of the large magnolias some of which already displayed their matchless and odoriferous flowers with their bell-shaped calluses purple without and silvery white within from which started forth the little gold-threaded stamens at a little distance were grouped the palm and date trees of the levant the red macaw and fig trees from india all blooming in full health and vigour and displaying their foliage in all its luxuriance gave to the two ensembles a mass of rich brilliant tropical verdure which glittering among the thousand lights sparkled with the colours of the emerald after the trellising between the orange trees and amid the clumps were trained every variety of rare climbing plants sometimes hanging their long wreaths of leaves and flowers in graceful festoons then depending like blooming serpents from the tall boughs now trailing at their roots then ambitiously scaling the very walls till they hung their united tresses round the transparent and vaulted roof from which again they floated in mingled masses waving in the pure light breeze loaded with so many odours the winged pomegranate the passion flower with its large purple flowers striated with azure and crowned with its dark violet tuft waved in long spiral wreaths over the heads of the admiring crowd then as though fatigued with the sport threw their colossal garlands of delicate flowers across the hard prickly leaves of the gigantic aloes the bignonia of india with its long cup-shaped flower of dark sulphur colour and slight slender leaves was placed beside the delicate flesh-coloured petals of the stephanotis so justly appreciated for its exquisite perfume 
the two stems mutually clinging to each other for support and mingling their leaves and flowers in one confused mass dispose them in elegant festoons of green fringe spangled with gold and silver spots around the immense velvet foliage of the indian fig farther on started forth and then fell again in a sort of variegated and floral cascade immense quantities of the stalks of the asclepias whose leaves large umbellated and in clusters of from fifteen to twenty star-shaped flowers grew so thickly so evenly that they might have been mistaken for bouquets of pink enamel surrounded with leaves of fine green porcelain the borders of the cases containing the orange sand camellias were filled with the choicest cape heaths the tulips of toll the narcissus of constantinople the hyacinths irides and the cyclamina of persia forming a sort of natural carpet presenting one harmonious blending of the loveliest tints chinese lanterns of transparent silk some pale blue others pink partly concealed amid the foliage threw a soft and gentle light over this enchanting scene nor could a more ingenious idea have been resorted to than in the happy amalgamation of these two colours by which a charming and almost unearthly light was produced combining the clear cerulean blue of a summer's night with the rose-coloured coruscations emitted from sparkling rays of an aurora borealis the entrance to this immense hot-house was from a long gallery glittering with gold with mirrors crystal vases filled with the choicest perfumes and brilliantly lighted and also raised a few steps above the fairy palace we have been endeavouring to describe the dazzling brightness of the approach served as a sort of penumbra in which were indistinctly traced out the gigantic exotics discernible through a species of arch partly concealed by two crimson velvet curtains looped back with golden cords so as to give a dim and misty view of the enchanted land that lay beyond an imaginative mind might easily have persuaded himself he stood near a huge window opening on some beautiful asiatic landscape during the tranquillity of a summer's twilight the sounds of the orchestra weakened by distance and broken by the joyous hum proceeding from the gallery died languidly away among the motionless foliage of the huge trees insensibly each fresh visitant to this enchanting spot lowered his voice until his words fell in whispers for the light genuine air embalmed with a thousand rich odours appeared to cast a sort of somnolency over the senses every breath seemed to speak of the clustering plants whose balmy sweetness filled the atmosphere certainly two lovers seated in some corner of this eden could conceive no greater happiness to be enjoyed on earth than thus dreamily to rest beneath the trees and flowers of this terrestrial paradise at the end of this winter garden were placed immense divans beneath the canopies of leaves and flowers the subdued light of the hothouse forming a powerful contrast with the gallery the distance seemed filled with a species of gold-coloured shining fog in the midst of which glittered and flickered like a living embroidery the dazzling and varied robes of the ladies combined with the prismatic scintillations of the congregated mass of diamonds and precious stones rodolph's first sensation upon arriving at this enchanting triumph of art over nature was that of most unfeigned surprise this is indeed a wonderfully beautiful carrying out of a poetical idea said he almost involuntarily then turning to the ambassadress he exclaimed madame till now i had not deemed such wonders practicable we have not in the scene before us a mere union of unbounded expense with the most exquisite taste but you give us poetry in action instead of writing as a master poet or painting as a first-rate artist you create that which they would scarcely venture to dream of your royal highness is too indulgent nay but candidly all must agree that the mind which could so faithfully depict this ravishing scene with its charm of colours and contrasts beyond us the loud notes of joy and mirthful revelry hear the soft silence and sweet gentle murmurs of distant voices that lull the spirit into a fancied flight beyond this fitful existence surely surely without suspicion of flattery it may be said of the planner and contriver of all this such a one was born a poet and a painter combined the praises of your royal highness are so much the more dangerous from the skill and cleverness with which they are uttered and which makes us listen to them with delight even in defiance of our sternest resolutions but allow me to call your royal highness's attention to the very lovely person who is approaching us i must have you admit 
that the marquise d'harville must shine pre-eminently beautiful any and everywhere is she not graceful and does not the gentle elegance of her whole appearance acquire a fresh charm from the contrast with the severe yet classic beauty by whom she is accompanied the individuals thus alluded to were the countess sarah macgregor and the marquise d'harville who were at this moment descending the steps which led from the gallery to the winter garden neither was the panegyric bestowed by the ambassadress on madame d'harville at all exaggerated no words can accurately describe the loveliness of her person and the marquise d'harville was then in the first bloom of youthful charms but her beauty delicate and fragile as it was appeared less to belong to the strict regularity of her features than to the irresistible expression of sweetness and universal kindness which imparted a charm to her countenance impossible to resist or to describe and this peculiar charm served invariably to distinguish madame d'harville from all other fashionable beauties for goodness of heart and kindliness of disposition are but rarely seen as the prevailing passions revealed in a face as fair as young high-born and ardently worshipped by all as was the marquise d'harville who shone forth in all her lustre as the brightest star in the galaxy of fashion too wise virtuous and right-minded to listen to the host of flatterers by whom she was surrounded madame d'harville smiled as gratefully on all as though she could have given them credit for speaking the truth had not her own modest opinion of her just claims to such homage have forbidden her accepting of praise she never could have deserved wholly indifferent to flattery yet sensibly alive to kindness she perfectly distinguished between sympathy and insincerity her acute penetration correct judgment and lively wit unmixed by the slightest ill nature made her wage an early though good-tempered war with those vain and egotistical beings who crowd and oppress society with the view of monopolizing general attention and blinded by their own self-love expect one universal deference and submission those kind of persons said madame d'harville one day laughingly appear to me as if their whole lives were passed in dancing le cavalier seul before an invisible mirror an unassuming and unpretending person however reserved and consequently unpopular he might be with others was sure to find a steady friend and partial observer in madame d'harville this trifling digression is absolutely essential to the right understanding of facts of which we shall speak hereafter the complexion of madame d'harville was of the purest white tinged with the most delicate carnation her long tresses of bright chestnut hair floated over her beautifully formed shoulders white and polished as marble it would be an impossible task to describe her large dark grey eyes fringed with their thick lashes and beaming with angelic sweetness her coral lips with their gentle smile gave to her eyes the indefinable charm that her affable and winning mode of expressing herself derived from their mild and angelic expression of approving goodness we will not farther delay the reader by describing the perfection of her figure nor dwell upon the distinguished air which marked her whole appearance she wore a white crape dress trimmed with the natural flowers of the camellia intermixed with its own rich green leaves here and there a diamond sparkled among the waxy petals as if a dewdrop fresh from its native skies had fallen there a garland of the same flowers equally ornamented with precious stones was placed with infinite grace upon her fair and open brow the peculiar style of the countess sarah macgregor's beauty served to set off the fair feminine loveliness of her companion though turned thirty-five years of age sarah looked much younger nothing appears to preserve the body more effectually from all the attacks of sickness or decay than a cold-hearted egotistical disregard of every one but ourselves it encrusts the body with a cold icy covering which alike resists the inroads of bodily or mental wear and tear to this cause may be ascribed the wonderful preservation of countess sarah's appearance the lady whose name we last mentioned wore a dress of pale amber watered silk beneath a crape tunic of the same colour a simple wreath of the dark leaves of the pyrus japonicus encircled her head and harmonized admirably with the bandeau of raven hair it confined this classically severe mode of head-dress gave to the profile of this imperious woman the character and resemblance of an antique statue many persons mistaking their real cast of countenance imagine some peculiar vocation delineated in their traits thus one man who fancies he possesses a warlike air assumes the warrior another imagines his eye in a fine frenzy rolling 
marks him out as a poet instantly he turns down his shirt collar adopts poetical language and writes himself a poet so the self-imagined conspirator wastes days and hours in pondering over mighty deeds he feels called upon to do the politician upon the same terms bores the world and his friends with his perpetual outpourings upon political economy and the man whose saintly turn of countenance persuades its owner into the belief of a corresponding character within forthwith abjures the pomps and vanities of the world and aims at reforming his brethren by his pulpit eloquence now ambition being sarah's ruling passion and her noble and aristocratical features well assisting the delusion she smiled as the word diadem crossed her thoughts and lent a willing ear to the predictions of her highland nurse and firmly believed herself predestined to a sovereign destiny spite of the trifling embonpoint that gave to her figure which though fatter than madame d'harville's was not less slender and nymph-like a voluptuous gracefulness sarah boasted of all the freshness of early youth and few could long sustain the fire of her black and piercing eyes her nose was aquiline her finely formed mouth and rich ruby lips were expressive of the highest determination haughtiness and pride the marquise and sarah had recognized rodolph in the winter garden at the moment they were descending into it from the gallery but the prince feigned not to observe their presence the prince is so absorbed with the ambassadress said madame d'harville to sarah that he pays not the slightest attention to us you are quite mistaken my dear clemence rejoined the countess the prince saw us as quickly and as plainly as we saw him but i frightened him away you see he still bears malice with me i am more than ever at a loss to understand the singular obstinacy with which he persists in shunning you you formerly an old friend countess sarah and myself are sworn enemies replied he to me once in a joking manner i have made a vow never to speak to her and you may judge how sacred must be the vow that hinders me from conversing with so charming a lady and strange and unaccountable as was this reply i had no alternative but to submit to it and yet i can assure you that the cause of this deadly feud half in jest and half in earnest as it is originates in the most simple circumstance were it not that a third party is implicated in it i should have explained the whole to you long ago but what is the matter my dear child you seem as though your thoughts were far from the present scene nothing nothing i assure you replied the marquise faintly but the gallery is so very hot it gave me a violent headache let us sit down here for a minute or two i hope and believe it will soon be better you are right see here is a nice quiet corner where you will be in perfect safety from the researches of those who are lamenting your absence added sarah pronouncing the last words with marked emphasis the two ladies then seated themselves on a divan almost concealed beneath the clustering shrubs and overhanging plants i said those who would be lamenting your absence my dear clemence come own that i deserve praise for so discreetly forming my speech the marquise blushed slightly cast down her eyes but spoke not how unreasonable you are exclaimed sarah in a tone of friendly reproach can you not trust me my dear child yes child for am i not old enough to be your mother not trust you uttered the marquise sadly alas have i not on the contrary confessed that to you which i should hardly have dared to own to myself well then come rouse yourself now let us have a little talk about him and so you have really sworn to drive him to despair for the love of heaven exclaimed madame d'harville think what you are saying i tell you i know him better than you do my poor child he is a man of cool and decided energy who sets but little value on his life he has had misfortunes enough to make him quite weary of it and it really seems as if you daily found greater pleasure in tormenting him and playing with his feelings is it possible you can really think so indeed in spite of myself i cannot refrain from entertaining that opinion oh if you but knew how oversusceptible some minds are rendered by a continuance of sorrows and afflictions just now i saw two large tears fall from his eyes as he gazed on you are you quite sure of what you say indeed i am quite certain and that too in a ballroom at the risk of becoming an object of general derision if this uncontrollable misery were perceived ah 
let me tell you a person must truly love to bear all this and even to be careless about concealing his sufferings from the world for the love of heaven do not speak thus replied madame d'harville in a voice trembling with emotion alas you have touched me nearly i know too well what it is to struggle with a hidden grief yet wear an outward expression of calmness and resignation alas alas tis the deep pity and commiseration i feel for him has been my ruin added she almost unconsciously nonsense what an over-nice person you are to talk of a little innocent flirtation being ruinous and that too with a man so scrupulously guarded as to abstain from ever appearing in your husband's presence for fear of compromising you you must admit that m charles robert is a man of surprising honour delicacy and real feeling i feel the more inclined to espouse his cause from the recollection that you have never met him elsewhere but at my house and because i can answer for his principles and that his devoted attachment to you can only be equalled by the deep respect he bears you i have never doubted the many noble qualities you have so repeatedly assured me he possesses but you know well that it is his long succession of bitter afflictions which have so warmly interested me in his favour and well does he merit this interest and most fully do his excellent qualities absolve you of all blame in thus bestowing it surely so fine and noble a countenance bespeaks a mind equally superior to all mankind how completely are you reminded while gazing on his tall and finely proportioned figure of the preux chevalier of bygone days sans peur et sans reproche i once saw him dressed in his uniform as commandant of the national guard and handsome as he is i really think he looks surpassingly well and i could not but say to myself that if nobility were the award of inward merit and external beauty m charles robert instead of being so called would take precedence of nearly all our dukes and peers would he not be a fitting representative of any of the most distinguished families in france you know my dear countess how very little importance i attach to mere birth and you yourself have frequently reproached me with being strongly inclined to republicanism said madame d'harville smiling gently for my own part i always thought with you that m charles robert required not the aid of rank or titles to render him worthy of universal admiration then what extreme talent he possesses what a fine voice he has and what delightful morning concerts we three have been able to achieve owing to his all-powerful assistance ah my dear clemence do you remember the first time you ever sang with him what passionate expression did he not throw into the words of that beautiful duet so descriptive of his love and his fear of offending her who was the object of it by revealing it let me entreat of you said madame d'harville after a long silence to speak of something else indeed i dare not listen further what you but just now intimated of his depressed and unhappy appearance has caused me much pain nay my dear friend i meant not to grieve you but merely to point out the probability that a man rendered doubly sensitive by the succession of past misfortunes might feel his courage insufficient to encounter the fresh trial of your rejection of his suit and thus be induced to end his hopeless love and his life together oh no more no more almost shrieked madame d'harville interrupting sarah this fearful idea has glanced across my mind already then after a second silence of some minutes the marquise resumed let us as i said before talk of somebody else of your mortal enemy for instance added she with assumed gaiety of manner come we will take the prince for a fresh theme of conversation i had not seen him previously to this evening for a very long time do you know that i think he looks handsomer than ever though all but king he has lost none of the winning sweetness and affability of his manner and spite of my republicanism i must confess i have seldom if ever known so irresistible a person sarah threw a side glance of deep and scrutinizing hatred upon her unconscious rival but quickly recovering herself she said gaily now my dear clemence you must confess to being a most capricious little lady you have regular alternating paroxysms of admiration and violent dislike for the prince why a few months ago i mean about his first arrival here you were so captivated by him that between ourselves i was half afraid you had lost your heart past all hope of recall thanks to you replied madame d'harville smiling my admiration was very short-lived 
for so well did you act up to your character of the prince's sworn foe in such fearful tales did you tell me of his profligacy and misconduct that you succeeded in inspiring me with an aversion as powerful as had been the infatuation which led you to fear for the safety of my heart which by the way i cannot think would ever have been placed in any danger from those attempts of your enemy to disturb its repose since shortly before you gave me those frightful particulars of the prince's character he had quite ceased to honour me with his visits although on the most intimate and friendly terms with my husband talking of your husband pray is he here to-night inquired sarah no replied madame d'harville in a tone of embarrassment he preferred remaining at home he seems to me to mix less and less in the world he never liked what is called fashionable gaiety the marquise's agitation visibly increased and sarah whose quick eye easily perceived it continued the last time i saw him he looked even paler than usual he has been very much out of health lately my dearest clemence will you permit me to speak to you without reserve oh yes pray do how comes it that the least allusion to your husband always throws you into such a state of extraordinary alarm and uneasiness what an idea is it possible you can mean it seriously asked poor madame d'harville trying to smile indeed i am quite in earnest rejoined her companion whenever you are speaking of him your countenance assumes even in spite of yourself but how shall i make myself understood and sarah with the tone and fixed gaze of one who wished to read the most secret thoughts of the person she addressed slowly and emphatically added a look of mingled aversion and fear the fixed pallid features of madame d'harville at first defied even sarah's practised eye but her keen gaze soon detected a slight convulsive working of the mouth with the tremulous movement of the under upper lip of her victim but feeling it unsafe to pursue the subject farther at this moment so as to awaken the marquise's mistrust of her friendly intentions by way therefore of concealing her real suspicions she continued yes just that sort of dislike any woman would entertain for a peevish jealous ill-tempered at this explanation of the countess's meaning as regarded madame d'harville's imagined dislike for her husband a heavy load seemed taken from her the working of her lip ceased and she replied let me assure you monsieur d'harville is neither peevish nor jealous then as if searching for some means of breaking a conversation so painful to her feelings she suddenly exclaimed ah here comes that tiresome friend of my husband's the duke de lucenay i hope he has not seen us where can he have sprung from i thought he was a thousand miles off it was reported that he had gone somewhere in the east for a year or two and behold at the end of five months here he is back again his unexpected arrival must have sadly annoyed the duchess de lucenay though poor de lucenay is a very inoffensive creature said sarah with an ill-natured smile nor will madame de lucenay be the only one to feel vexation at his thus changing his mind her friend m de saint-remy will duly and affectionately sympathize in all her regrets on the subject come come my dear sarah i cannot allow you to scandalize say that this return of m de lucenay is a nuisance to everybody the duke is sufficiently disagreeable for you to generalize the regret his unexpected presence occasions i do not slander i merely repeat it is also said that m de saint-remy the model of our young elegante whose splendid doings have filled all paris is all but ruined tis true he has by no means reduced either his establishment or his expenditure however there are several ways of accounting for that in the first place madame de lucenay is immensely rich what a horrible idea still i only repeat what others say there the duke sees us he is coming towards us we must resign ourselves to our fate miserable is it not i know nothing so hard to bear as that man's company he makes himself so very disagreeable and then laughs so disgustingly loud at the silly things he says indeed he is so boisterous that the bare idea of him makes one think of pretending to faint or any other pretext to avoid him talking of fainting pray let me beg of you if you have the least regard for your fan or essence bottle to beware how you allow him to handle either for he has the unfortunate habit of breaking whatever he touches and all with the most facetious self-satisfied air imaginable 
End of chapter 26 End of volume 1 of The Mysteries of Paris by Eugène Sue Recorded by Céline Major.